This was Blue Cove Hideaway. My mission was to build the best summer attraction in the southern United States. A place that opened up all kinds of opportunities for all kinds of people. The goal was to have camping, swimming, zip lining, a place where kids can have fun. A place where people that grew up going there could one day tell their kids about the stories of what it was like when they were kids. A place that gave that getaway that we all need. A place that built into a thriving community. My goals were much bigger than words could ever describe. The goal was to build the best summer attraction in the southern United States. In another story, I'm going to give you guys the backstory of Blue Cove and everything that led up to it actually operating, all the way from the cleanup event, the volunteers, and all the people that were involved with making it real. But in this story, we're going to talk about what it was like once the cove was officially open to the public. While I was away, a neighbor that lived nearby came to talk to my head of security and ask him information about the back property. The cove is divided into three different sections, okay? So we have the actual water, we have this back piece of property, and then the center part of the property is what we use as our access routes to get to our campsites, as well as moving around for our events and everything. That section right in the middle is the section that our neighbor was focused on. And we, we've we seen this guy a few times, but he, he didn't normally come by. During this time, I'm on a tour working for a few more festivals so that I can wrap my season up and officially be at the code full time. My security operator gave this man my number and told him, please contact me and talk about what your plans are and what you have going on. Long story short, I got no phone calls. After I got done talking to my security operator about everything that he was saying, the guy started, it's like he started to ramp up his activity once he asked, um, once he found out that I wasn't gonna be back in a while. Then he hired a ranch hand, which is someone that we once knew, and let's just say um, things didn't go well. My security operators got into a confrontation with this man and somehow a firearm was pulled. I have signs that say no unauthorized person can have firearms. No firearms allowed on the property. We do that because of all these mass shootings and things that go on nationwide so that we know if we see somebody with the weapon in the area that we were in, we would be able to address the situation with more caution and figure out what was going on because when you're operating a camp um there's things that people don't think about some people are thinking about oh this is this would be cool this would be cool this would be cool but sometimes you got to think about the worst and often i had nightmares about the worst things that could happen there and i wanted to do everything in my power to prevent those things from happening 
Um, after getting more information from my security operator, I got information that they wanted to fence in all of the back part of the property, cutting us off from our campsites. Um, and during this time, I'm kind of sitting here processing all of it, like, is this happening? This isn't really happening. So, um, eventually the guy, after everything kind of boiled over and all hell broke loose, um, I, the guy finally contacted me and, and found, and I guess with him hearing my voice and actually talking to me, he got to see that I wasn't, um, I wasn't some guy just throwing parties in a backfield. Um, and I think that it kind of opened his eyes a little bit and he, um, he said that he'll pause all operation until I get out there. When I got that information, it was kind of like a, a glimmer of hope, I guess, but then things took an even further turn. And this ranch hand got into an argument with one of my other operators and threatened to kill him in front of his son. And we got this on the video. And after that, when I got that information, I told everyone, I said, get all the valuables off and take them to safe locate, to these specific safe locations. And we're gonna close down until we can figure out everything that's going on and, and be able to operate again. As time went by, um, I was, um, that kind of shifted me wanting to go out there. And I look back on it now and it's like, the best things in life are on the other side of fear, but for some reason, this one, something told me if I went out there, things might be a little bit different. Um, and I guess, I guess I, for my safety, I just wanted to really process and figure out how could I approach this? What, what, what route do I take? Um, because obviously some people are more hostile in this situation. And I've been around these people to see the difference in, um, um, attitudes and and behaviors on a deeper level um, it was weird because I had been working for a long time and running around chasing all these things trying to make these things that I saw real and once it finally was becoming real my brain was almost um, my brain was in a in a processing phase where it was like okay now you can focus on this. You don't have to keep running. And one week away from me being at that point, it just like everything was just taken. It was paw. Everything was put on pause. It was just my brain was so rattled to just understand what was going on. But I knew that whatever it was had to get figured out. But I blame myself in certain ways for my uh, not being able to be out there. Often when I was um. When I was, when I was out working these events and doing concrete or whatever I was doing, that was that was my only way of funding the code for the time being. I had really big missions and plans for that season, and it was really heartbreaking to process that it was all put on pause and maybe forever done. But I tried to be positive through it, but also I had to sit with the reality of what was going on. So this has probably been a week now, and after this week, um, I'm almost done with this last tour, and I'm like, okay, I need to get out there. And I start getting death threats. And I start having people call the Google voice number, which is the Cove's business number, saying there, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna kill you, N-word. Um, can't wait to see you around our parts. Um, Hey, just call in to talk to the owner of Blue Cove. We can't wait to see you when you get back. We're going to have fun with you, N-Word. And, and at the same time, my security are telling me that they're seeing armed people drive by. They're seeing people on the property because our security is now off the property. I pulled everyone away from the property. And they're telling me about all this activity that's still going on. And I contact the law. And I said, hey, can you guys, what do I do? What, what like this is kind of the last time I contacted the law before I even started this project I asked them how do I get this place open they told me it wasn't possible so I went through the state and the county and um and the court system and this time I contacted them and said hey I have a serious problem and they said basically they can't do anything about it um and that was basically that so after all that has gone on the guy that wanted to buy this property 
ended up firing or or cutting somehow communication just stopped with the ranch hand he then came to one of my security operators had a good conversation with him and said that why don't you become my ranch hand for for us it was like a hooray like no way really you want to work with one of our people yeah we would love to like we would love to and the guy was willing to do it so i contact the person that i was operating my business with and said hey man we can operate and he basically told me that he's been making money without me regardless he doesn't need me so i don't know what was going on while i wasn't out there but that was where he turned away and said he didn't need me but i gotta say like you can't just you can't blame you can't point the finger at everyone else saying that this is his fault his fault and his fault ultimately the business i'm the business owner and it falls on me for the way that i had the way that i acted and my problem was communication i had people trying to contact me i had people trying to call me and i couldn't even uh i i don't know how to exp- i was so m- in such a mental a mental tornado that i failed with my communication and that ultimately caused it caused the relationship to have a strain. And after all of this, um, I think that that's something that I've really been reflecting on is my communication. I might be a great worker, I might have great intentions, but that doesn't mean that I don't need to, I, if I see a phone call, I can't, I can't just say I'm gonna call him back in a little bit and not call him for three months. You know, that's where I look back on and I realize that my communication uh, was part of the it was my biggest flaw. My biggest flaw was my communication, because yeah, it let people grow their own perspectives of how you work and operate. Because they're just kind of seeing it from their angle, but you're not communicating well enough with them for them to understand it from your point of view. So my goal now is communication through whatever I do. That's one of my top priorities. Before it was like before it was like grind hard and it's possible now it's like grind hard but also value the people that are with you and or and even if you do value the people that are with you make sure that they feel valued so that about wraps up the first part of this story in the next video i'm going to talk to you guys about the stages of operation the, um, the people that were all involved as well as some of the untold stories so hope you guys enjoy it and i can't wait to share some more so let's go